Jenny and I are care consultants with PSS Circle of Care, uh, which provides free personalized support for those who are caring for someone who is frail, chronically ill, or has memory loss, such as Alzheimer's or any other type of dementia. We also have our uh, grandparent family apartments in the Bronx, um, where we provide services for grandparents or family members other than a parent who are raising a grand, uh, grandchild. Okay, uh, some of our other programs, we have our coming of age program, uh, which inspires uh, adults 50 and older to live with passion and purpose. And as I said, we have our 10 centers uh, to help older adults stay healthy, engaged, and connected. And we always welcome volunteers uh, who serve an important role in delivering our services. Okay, and uh, finally, uh, we encourage everyone to take the 2020 census. Um, so again, these are tough times for all of us. Uh, help your help your community receive the federal funding it needs for the next 10 years by taking 10 minutes to complete your 2020 census. Hospitals, schools, roads, transportation, and more all receive the federal funding based on the census data that is collected. So take that 2020 census, they've been coming around. Uh, any questions or comments that you have, uh, if you look at the bottom of your screen, you will see that there's a Q&A box and a chat box. Uh, so any questions, go in that Q&A box and any comments, please, in that chat box and we will get to as many or all of them if possible. Um, and thank you for participating in this webinar. Uh, these are our websites. Um, please feel free to check them out. Um, PSS. Uh, PSSCaregivers.org. Uh, that is our main website. And uh, feel free to check out our events page where you can learn about um, more events like this that we have coming up. Uh, certainly also check out our resources page where all of these webinars uh, are recorded, by the way, uh, and they get posted there. So um, if you feel like you want to um, rewatch any of these webinars, definitely go and check them out there. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you, Julie. Okay, so with that, um, I'm not gonna waste any more time because we had a little bit of a rough start. So Gia, like we, um, like we you know, got going in the beginning, I'm gonna stop sharing and then um, we're gonna let our wonderful panelists take it away today. Great, thank you. All right, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Gia Ramsey, and I am the Injury Prevention Education Outreach Coordinator at Maimonides Medical Center. And Julia Glaubach is the Injury Prevention Coordinator at Staten Island University Hospital. So the two of us have very similar roles. Um, we both do adult and pediatric programming. We both have nursing backgrounds. So we put this presentation together um, as a uh, just a kind of overview of some of the key points to be healthy as you age. So it is Fall Prevention Awareness Week, and this is one of the many fall prevention awareness activities happening throughout the week. So before I jump into the presentation, I do just want to show you, um, and I will put a lot of these into the chat box as we go, just so you can get, you can click on them and there are links that you can, um, check out all of the websites we'll be talking about, including the Fall Prevention Awareness Week schedule and calendar and a great resource guide that the New York City Falls Prevention Coalition put together. So this is our schedule for the week of all of the events happening. And you'll see there are a few more left tomorrow and Friday. Um, this I will, like I said, we'll put into the chat box so you can click on it and these are all clickable. You can go right on and either register or some of them you don't need to register. Just click on that link and join in. Um, but the second page of this is really, really important. These are some great resources that we've put together that um, you can use uh, home safety checklists, um, preventing falls in older adults, 
all these things, some of them which we'll talk about in our presentation, are all clickable and accessible for you. So um, please, please, please keep that in mind. Share it with whoever um, you know that is an older adult or maybe maybe takes care of an older adult in these situations. So please share that along and we're going to try to prevent as many falls as we can. So although this is a healthy aging for older adults presentation, there are a quite a few um, fall prevention tips that we'll be sharing uh, throughout, especially because it's fall prevention week. So we're going to jump right in. Let me get my PowerPoint up for you all. Okay, so throughout the presentation, we will be asking a few questions. You can put them into the Q&A, type in any um, comments into the chat box. Um, so this is a little bit interactive. Be, be ready for that. The first thing we're going to talk about in the presentation, um, we're gonna talk about medicines. Now, your medicine should be helping you and not hurting you. So that really kind of means if you are taking a medication and not feeling well, say you're feeling dizzy, lightheaded, um, maybe you, you know how sometimes you stand up too fast and you kind of feel that like blurry vision, lightheadedness. If that's happening more frequently, not just when you're standing up, um, if you're ever having any side effects, you always want to bring that up to your doctor because as you age, your body may react differently to the medications that you may have been taking for a while. So for instance, if you were prescribed a blood pressure medicine when you were 55 and you're still taking it and now you're 75, you may not need that same amount um, of medication and, or you may not need to take it as at the same time as you've been taking it. But if you're ever having any side effects, if you're ever not feeling right, it's very important that you talk to your doctor because it could be the medication that you're on, even if it's just like the amount or when you're taking it. Um, now that I said that, let's ask our first question. So in the chat box, you're gonna write in yes or no. Do you see more than one doctor that prescribes you a medication? So for instance, do you see a cardiologist that prescribes you one doctor or um, one medicine and a primary care doctor that prescribes you another? So if you do see more than one doctor who prescribes you medication, type yes into that chat box. Um, if you do not, then you can press no. So let's see. We have a yes, we have a no. See if we can get a few others. All right, and some people, you don't have to say no worries either way. Um, but if you are having, if it's if the answer is yes, um, and you're getting one medication from one doctor and another from another doctor, they may not realize that those two medications are not working well together. So it's very, very important that you have a list of all of the medications that you're taking with you whenever you go to the doctor. Now, I know some people like to grab all of their pill bottles and throw them in a Ziploc bag and try to, you know, take them all out at the doctor's office. It's not always the easiest thing to do, and it's a pain in the butt when you have to go home and rearrange all of them on your shelf. So, I do suggest that you um, make a list of all of your medications. So this is a great medicine list card that the Poison Control Center made. And this is actually one of those clickable links on the resource page that I'm going to be um, posting into the chat box. Um, you'll see here, you have your name at the top and your information. And then at the bottom, it has your doctor's names, your pharmacy, your emergency contacts, all of that is right there for you. Um, and then you'll also notice um, that they are uh, they want you to put your brand name your generic name what you're taking it for when to take it how much to take it when you need a refill and who prescribed it this way there's really no question of why you're taking a medication and who gave it to you so if you go to the doctor you'll have it all in one place now another thing to point out is that at the very top, it says that you should include all of your prescription medications, 
your non-prescription medications. So if you're taking like an over-the-counter heartburn medicine, that should be on there too. Um, herbals, vitamins, and minerals can also should also be on this list because, and, and you may think like, oh, why does a vitamin need to be on there? Some certain vitamins interact in a negative way with certain medications, so they should all be on there. Everything you take should be listed. Now, I see there are only four little uh, boxes here. There is actually a second side to this or another page, so you can have them all in one place. And this is also good to have with you, like at home, next to the phone, maybe next to your medications. So if you're ever feeling, say you get a new medication from a doctor prescribed to you, and you start taking it and you're not feeling well, and you wake up in the middle of the night and you don't feel well, your doctor's office is closed, your pharmacy is closed, well, the good thing is the Poison Control Center is open 24-7, 365, and that's the phone number, 1-800-222-1222. You can call them and you'll have all of your medications right there. Easy for you to explain, you know, what the current circumstance is. So have this medication list with you. Make sure that it's in an easy to access place and you bring it with you to all of your doctor's visits. All right, next, Julie is going to talk a little bit about aging in your eyes and also a little bit about your hearing. Okay, so hello everybody and thank you for joining. So just as you should have an annual checkup with your primary care doctor, you should also have your eyes checked at least once a year. You should schedule an appointment right away if you suddenly can't see, have blurry vision, have flashes of light, eye pain, double vision, redness, or swelling of your eye or eyelid. Um, if, even if you have discharge or you have your floaters suddenly get worse, you know your own body the best. And if something is unusual or abnormal in your vision, especially if it comes on acutely or suddenly, you definitely should get it checked out. Um, so if you have any of those symptoms, you're gonna call and make an appointment right away. There's a lot of different eye diseases and disorders and they can lead to things like vision loss and blindness if they're not treated, okay? So some of the disorders and diseases don't even have symptoms right away. That's why it's important to have that annual eye exam every single year. So we know that having good vision is important. A lot of falls that we see happen to, because people have blurry vision or have trouble seeing or diminished vision, okay? We all know that the sidewalks um, and even your home environment is the floors and the, the, the uh, ground is not always perfectly even. So you need to be able to see well to see if there's cracks or raised areas that you could trip on. If you don't have the right prescription in your glasses, you won't really be able to see what's in front of you and that can lead to a fall. Another important health check is hearing. About one in four adults age 60 to 69 and half of all adults age 70 to 79 have some form of hearing loss. And that number rises to eight and 10 for adults aged 80 and over. Those, statist those statistics are important because there is a definite association between hearing loss and falls. In fact, even mild hearing loss is associated with a three time greater risk of falls. So hearing loss has been specifically linked to slower walking speed, frailty, increased risk for injuries and hospitalizations due to falls, and ultimately poor quality of life. The good news though, is that hearing loss can be corrected. For people with hearing loss, using a hearing aid is associated with the reduced risk in falls. Just having a hearing aid isn't enough. You have to have it on so that you're able to hear, okay? So having one is the first step, but you really do have to have it on. And that's even when somebody is not speaking directly to you. If you're in the outside environment and you can't hear traffic and you can't hear somebody, let's say a horn honking on a bicycle that's coming your way or loud noise in an area that you know you might want to avoid because something's going on you can walk right into it or you can trip and fall all right so the big takeaway is you need to get your vision and hearing checked every single year 
Thank you. Sorry, I was muted. Yeah, it's very important. Um, we see so many falls that occur because people can't see or hear things. So get your vision and hearing checked. Okay, so now I'm going to talk a bit about um, two things that are very, very important and sometimes very hard to keep up with, staying active and eating well. So the first, staying active. Now, I know with COVID times, some of us may have kind of, you know, gone into a little bit more of a sedentary lifestyle. So it's especially important that you keep active, keep that blood flowing, especially if you have things like arthritis or any chronic diseases that could make exercise hard. And I personally um, have a joint disorder. So sometimes it's a little bit hard for me to keep up on a routine, but it's so important to keep those muscles strong, especially if you are an older adult, because you're at higher risk for falling. If you have weak muscles and poor balance and coordination, if you trip, there will be nothing really to hold you back. So it's good to keep a regular exercise routine. So we want to focus on four areas of exercise. You want to focus on endurance, balance, strength, and flexibility. And you should try to be active at least three days a week. And starting an exercise routine doesn't really need to look like, oh, going to the gym every day or, you know, things like that. You can actually get a lot of activity done right in your own home. So there are a lot of great classes that are available virtually now, um, a lot of great YouTube videos that you can watch that are, you know, for exercising for older adults, but everyday tasks could also be an activity. Think about it. I don't know if it's just my vacuum cleaner or what, but after I vacuum the house, I feel like I did some exercise, right? I feel it in my muscles. Sometimes I wake up the next day and I feel it in my arms. Um, things like making the bed, you're pulling the sheets over, you know, all of that is actually exercise. So it doesn't mean you have to have a, you know, a, a gym routine, but you can do a lot of things at home. So kind of keep that in mind, especially during COVID times. We're at home, we are doing a lot of things at home and exercise is one of them. So things you can use around the house for exercise. You don't need to go out and buy a bunch of weights. You can do things with cans of food. You can just do some arm workouts. You can get moving. You can also do a lot of exercises while you're sitting on the couch watching TV, which is a very common thing to do these days. So you're watching The Price is Right in the morning, commercials come on, which commercials are now much longer than they used to be. So you have plenty of time to get your blood pumping and get moving. If you think about how much time you would be um, exercising if you worked, if you did some exercises during every commercial break for one show, you can get almost your whole exercise routine done for the day while you're watching TV. So as you're sitting on the couch, you can do some of those arm lifts, you can lift your legs up, and you can um, just get your body moving. And also you can do a lot of exercises while you're eating or while you're making food in the kitchen. So you're standing at the countertop while you're waiting for your water to boil. You can hold on to the edge of the, the um, countertop and you can go up on your toes. You can lift your knees up. You can do a lot of things right from your own house. So it doesn't mean you have to go and buy a gym membership. You can do it all at home if you need to. Um, also, if you're able to get outside and take a walk, if the weather is beautiful right now, this is the perfect time for it. Wear your mask, go outside, get your blood pumping, but always, always, always keep up um, and keep exercising. Now, I'm going to show a website that I really, really love. It's from the National Institute on Aging. So let me just switch screens over here real quick. Now, the National Institute on Aging has a website that has really, really great um, exercise and activity tools. So if you go to their website and you go under health information, oh, sorry, went to a different, went to a different area. So if you scroll down, there is a tab for exercise and physical activity. 
Now, when you go on this site, there are some great resources. If you haven't done any physical activity lately, start here. How to get started with exercise. You can click on that. It'll show you a bunch of different types of exercises. See right here, four types of exercise. So if you feel like you're, um, you're pretty flexible, but you don't have a lot of endurance, you can't you know, do that much activity for that long, click on that and you can get some great tips. Um, also, something that we like to point out for fall prevention in general is finding the right shoe. So I always say, if you can slip your foot into a shoe and there's no back, if you can slip your foot in, guess what? Your foot can easily slip out. So it's important to try to find a shoe that has a back to it. You want a shoe that has a rubber sole, especially if you're doing um, exercises, rubber soles, um, you have enough room for your toes inside of your shoe because especially those who have um, diabetes you need extra space for your toes so you're not cramped in there um, that's uncomfortable either way nobody wants that um, so have a nice fitting shoe and some other things but if you just if i scroll down a little bit further um, exercise and physical activity tracking tools now, I'm a very visual person, so if I tell myself like, oh, I'm going to I'm going to do I'm going to work out three times a week for a half hour in two weeks, there's a possibility that I may not have kept up with that schedule that I originally planned. But if I have it written down on an activity log, I can see like, oh, it's been a couple days. I have to get my exercise in for the day. So having that activity log, you can have these all either use them virtually or print them out and keep a nice checklist of what you're doing when. All right, so another thing that I really, really enjoy, and I mentioned this a little bit earlier about YouTube videos, um, the National Institute on Aging also has a great YouTube channel. They have some other resources, but um, if you scroll down, they have exercises for stretching, building strength, balance and they're pretty short so if you're not really sure where to start this is a great place and you can just click on the video and watch it and do everything right in your in your own home okay let me come back to the presentation now and i'll also put these websites um, i'll be putting them in the comment box after um, i'm done with the presentation because i can only type i can copy and paste while i'm when I, I cannot copy and paste when i'm presenting so um, we're also going to talk a little bit about eating a well-balanced meal. Now, it's a little bit hard also during COVID times. I know some things are not as easily accessible as they were a few months ago, but this is what a well-balanced meal should look like. So you see there are grains up at the top. And when you're eating, when you're trying to plan out your meals, you want to choose grains that are whole grains. So choose brown rice instead of white rice, brown um, whole wheat pasta instead of just regular white pasta. So whole wheat grains, and then down at the bottom, protein. Now you want this protein to be lean protein. Now I know sometimes certain meats taste a little bit better if they have a little bit more fat in them, but you really wanna try to get the lean protein in. Oh, sorry about that. And then you have your fruits and vegetables over here. Now, this was something that I really wasn't aware of, that fruits and vegetables that are orange, purple, green, and red actually have higher nutrient values than others. So you see that's actually the same color as this plate, orange, purple, green, and red. So you really wanna try to choose fruits and vegetables that are those colors. Um, and then up at the top, dairy. Dairy is very important. It's good for your bones, You've heard this before. Um, if you can try to choose like a low fat dairy, if you're able to drink milk, great. If you're not, sometimes it messes with people's stomach. You can also have yogurts, cheeses. Um, and if you can't have any of those, you probably are aware of some substitutes to really get all of the nutrients that you would usually get from a glass of milk. Um, so the choosemyplate.gov website also has some great resources for older adults. So these are ways to eat well as you get older. Number one, know what a healthy plate looks like, and I just showed you one. Two, look for important nutrients. 
So you wanna make sure that you're eating enough of each one of those things every day. And then number three, read nutrition labels. And now I know sometimes they're a little bit of a pain in the butt because they're very small, um, but it's very important that you get familiar with what a nutrition label looks like. And on that Choose My Plate website, it goes into more detail than what I'm going to right now, but you want to look at the different nutrients in your food. So for instance, this is a can of olives and five olives has 6% of my daily sodium intake. And some things have even more. So like if you are eating a can of soup and it has 40% of your daily sodium intake in it, you may want to kind of rethink that or plan ahead for dinner so you're not eating another sodium packed dinner. So familiar yourself with the, familiarize yourself with the labels. Also, another thing with labels is make sure that you use the recommended serving sizes. So on this bag of granola that I have here, you'll see that there's a serving size for if I'm snacking on it and I'm only, it's only a third of a cup or as a cereal, which is two thirds of a cup. And I don't know about you, I have a thing with cereal. I eat a, what my fiance calls a GSI bowl. I can't eat a serving size of cereal. I always have to double it. I don't know why, it's just a thing. I have to eat a lot of cereal, but I am then aware that it's not just one serving size. So I'm not eating this many calories or this much sugar or this much sodium. I'm doubling that. So just be aware of what the serving size is for what you're eating, because you may look at it and be like, oh, it's, an, it's only 140 calories, but that's for a third of a cup, which is a very small amount. So kind of plan ahead, look at your labels and make sure you're getting the correct nutrient values throughout the day. Um, the next thing is stay hydrated. Now, staying hydrated is sometimes hard for people, but very, very important. So if, you're high, if you are dehydrated, that can cause you to get dizzy and lightheaded and could cause you actually to fall. Or you can get a UTI, which could also cause you to fall. Um, but it's very important that you drink as much water as you can throughout the day. Personally, for me, I drink warm water better and easier than I drink cold water. So I have a pitcher of warm water with me that I just kind of refill my cup throughout the day and that helps me get my water intake up. So you do what's best for you, but very, very important, drink lots of water. Um, and then the last thing is stretch your food budget. Now, who doesn't wanna save money? I know times are tight right now. So if you can um, and you need assistance with food, um, either low cost or free food. There are a lot of resources out there. Um, 311 has all of them. So if you call 311 and say that you need help, you need some assistance with food, they will ask you the questions to point you in the right direction, whether that's like SNAP or City Meals on Wheels. But there are a lot of great resources throughout the city that could help you if you need free or low cost meal options. All right, any questions about nutrition before we move on? Okay, great. So Julie is going to talk about our next fun subject. Hi, we're gonna talk about dealing with crazy drivers, otherwise known as pedestrian safety. So um, we all New York City residents, we know what it's like to be out there in the streets, walking the streets, using the roadways, using the sidewalks, there's always a lot of traffic seemingly wherever you go. Even here on Staten Island, we got plenty of traffic. There's no shortage at all, okay? So you wanna make sure that when you are out and about that you're not really in a rush, that you're aware of your time and the dangers that you, know, you can encounter in the street from cyclists, um, from cars, and even from other pedestrians rushing or not paying attention or looking at their phones and they're not looking up and they can walk right into you, okay? So one thing you want to do is you want to give yourself plenty of time to cross at crosswalks and you always want to look out for drivers. Those are two very important things that you want to do. So when you get to a street and you're about to cross, you really want to remember those two things. Do I have enough time and am I watching out for drivers, especially drivers that are going to be making a turn? 
okay, and maybe cutting into the crosswalk and coming across where pedestrians are crossing. Okay, so the Department of Transportation um, has done a lot over the years to help reduce older adult pedestrian injuries and deaths. All right, so they, they're aware of that. And, um, you know, Vision Zero's goal is to prevent all deaths from traffic accidents. So why would focus on senior pedestrians? So why, why is the focus on older um, New Yorkers, older adults? Well, first, the New York City senior population is increasing as baby boomers reach retirement age. Seniors in New York City tend to walk much more than anywhere else in the US. We've all heard about how New York is such a walkable city and people walk everywhere. Well, that's true. That's not so true in other areas that are more rural and suburban where you, know, you may have to drive or take other forms of transportation. Also, the senior fatality rate is, um, is four times that of younger New Yorkers. So pedestrian, senior pedestrian fatality rate is very high. It's not so much that they get hit more often. It's that if, a, if an older adult is struck by a car, they're likely to suffer more serious injuries than if a younger person is struck by a car. Okay, so for a little background, let's say 13% of New York City population is seniors. So 13% of the total population are seniors but 39% of the New York City pedestrian traffic fatalities are seniors. So even though they're only 13% of the population, they make up 39% of the traffic, of the pedestrian traffic um, fatalities. So the DOT has made some changes and accommodations, especially aimed at older pedestrians. They've added sidewalk extensions to shorten crossing and slow turning vehicles, as well as a lot of countdown signals, which tell pedestrians how much more time they have to cross. So when you're almost every intersection, major intersection in New York City has these countdown clocks and you've seen them. So once the clock starts counting down, that's telling you how many seconds you have left to make it across the street. So if you're ready to cross the street and there's only three seconds left on the clock, that's probably not a good time for anybody to be crossing, especially somebody who's older and might be walking slower. So if you don't have enough time and the clock is showing you that, that you don't, then just wait for a fresh signal before you cross. Just stop and wait. It's only a few seconds or a minute at most, and then the light will change again and you'll have a fresh clock and you'll be able to have the most time that you have to complete your journey, okay? They've also put in um, pedestrian safety islands like the one in this picture. You can see the people crossing in the crosswalk over here. Um, on the right-hand side, um, there's bollards over here that actually protect pedestrians from turning vehicles. And on the left where the tree is, you can see in this kind of median over here, if you're crossing the street, and you can't make it all the way across, or somebody cuts the light, a truck comes suddenly, you can always stop here at this uh, pedestrian safety median and wait until you have enough time to cross, even if that means waiting for a fresh clock, okay? It's really important um, that you are aware of these uh, safety um, you know, um, initiatives and that you use them when you're crossing because they're very important. You don't have to risk your life and hurry across the street when there's a median that you can wait on, okay? Um, so you can always stop in the island and just wait for the next crossing signal. Um, DOT has also added barriers so drivers can't cut their turns off. Um, and the other big thing is the speed limit, which is reduced to 25 miles an hour on most city streets from 30, okay? And those five miles an hour can cause great damage to somebody who is hit. So the slower people drive, the safer. So we all know though, that even if we are being good pedestrians, there's always a risk when we use the streets. Drivers might not be going the speed limit. They, they can speed, they may not be, paying attention, they can be on their phone, they can be texting, they can be distracted by something in the car. Bicycles can go the wrong direction on a one-way street. So you really do wanna make sure that you're paying attention 
um, even when you're doing the right thing, that you're paying attention to the traffic environment, to the street environment, and that you're always looking out. And don't rush because you know the drivers are going to start going, start driving again as soon as they see that that light turns green. Okay, so you know the drivers will are waiting for that. So make sure that you're always looking. All right. A lot of pedestrians are actually hit by cars when they're turning left. That's the most dangerous turn to make because it involves the widest, the longest amount of time that a car has to travel when a car is making a left-hand turn. All right. So especially when it's a left-turning street, make sure you're always on the lookout. If you can, make eye contact with the driver um, and make sure that they're paying attention and looking at you before you start to cross, even if you have the right of way. Also important to wear bright colored clothing or even a clip-on flashing LED light. My stepmother um, lives in the West Village. She's 83 and she got this flashing LED light really from a 99 cent store and she puts it on whenever she goes out and it's dusk or dawn. She presses a button when she's crossing the street, and this really does in, in, increase pedestrian visibility. And you, it's got different settings, so it has a pulse setting, it has a steady on, it has a, a, a lower light emission, and then you just tap the button to turn it off. You're not going to be flashing the whole time when you're on the sidewalk, but it is a really good idea. Just like when you see a, bicycle, a cyclist coming and they have one of those flashing lights, it really increases the visibility and it makes it just easier for drivers to see you and that's the whole idea. Um, so remember, you can't control the drivers, but you can take control yourself and your actions in the street. Okay, any questions on pedestrian safety? All right, so we're gonna move on to home hazards, okay? And making sure that your home doesn't become a hazard, all right? Um, so you wanna get rid of slip and trip hazards. That's very important because most falls actually occur. Actually, we'll do the poll question um, first. Um, do, when, Gia, do you, should we do the poll question on falls? Yeah, sure. So we have a poll question um, that Gia is going to type into the chat. Where do you think most falls occur? Out on the street or in the home? You can type in your, in your answer, either street or home. Okay, we have a home. All right, we have two homes. Two homes. Three homes. All right, thank you all for those who, who participated. Okay, so for those who participated, you're right. Most falls actually do occur in the home and the majority of those falls actually occur in the living area and or on the stairs of the home. And that kind of makes sense because you spend probably most of your time in the living area of your home, in the living room area of your home. And of course we know that stairs are always a trip and fall hazard. So it kind of makes sense that those two would um, have would generate the most falls, right? One thing that definitely causes slip and trip hazards are throw rugs or loose rugs, okay? Many people are very attached to their throw rugs. They've had them for years and they're not about to give them up. If you must have a throw rug, then at least have a non-skid backing on the back of it so that it's secure on the floor. And you can get those at any hardware store, any Home Depot, non-skid backing, make sure it's attached to the, or applied to your throw rug. And then at least you know that the rug's not gonna slide out, okay, from under you. And that's very important because many falls, many slips really do come from those, um, those, those throw rugs, all right? Um, also, pets can be another hazard. Um, and their toys. So here we have a very cute puppy and we're not telling you to get rid of your dog or your cat or your rabbit or whatever you have, just to be aware that they are underfoot um, and they do move around and that you have to be aware that they're there 
and they can carry their toys from one place to another. And you can easily slip and fall on them because you haven't put that toy there. You know, um, Rover has, and you're not aware that it's there. So just, you have a pet, just always keep in the back of your mind, where's my, my, um, my pet and where are their toys? Make sure you're always um, looking um, for that, okay? Um, so, um, so, um, so when we run our data on falls, um, a lot of the data that, that we see coming into Maimonides in Staten Island University Hospital, um, most of the falls are slips and trips and tumbles that do occur inside the home. And lighting can be a factor as well, um, lighting and clutter. So in this picture on the left, you see a lamp here by the bed, and we recommend that. That's a great idea because if you have to get up in the middle of the night um, and it's dark, um, and you have an easily accessible light by the side of your bed, whether it's a standing lamp or a night light on the table, um, you know that you will be able to have a, a, a clear vision of where you're going. Whereas if you get up and it's dark and you have to make it all the way, let's say, to use the bathroom, uh, you may easily slip and fall, especially if things have been left on the floor, maybe before you went to sleep inadvertently. There's slippers over here. There's a basket with some books. Perhaps you fell asleep reading or you left your slippers out by the side of the bed. Those things can become such trip hazards. So it's very important um, to have a light by your bed and also to just try to put things in their place so that you have a clear path so you can get from um, place A to place B clearly uh, and without you know any obstructions in the way. Um, a night light is great, especially a motion detected uh, uh, motion sensor night light that detects motion and comes on as you uh, walk by. You can have those um, on the way to the bathroom as well as in the bathroom. Um, it provides enough light for you to see where you're going and to avoid um, trips and stumbles, all right? Um, so in 2018, uh, the Department of uh, Health and Mental Hygiene surveyed 200 older Staten Island residents, 65 and older. And they found that a third of those that were surveyed um, had a fall in the past year. And more than half of those falls occurred at home. And as we said, the living room and stairs were the most common locations, okay? Um, so we could talk all day about this, but overall, what you really wanna do is go through all the rooms of your home to spot hazards. Anything that you can trip on is a hazard. Throw rugs, pets, like we mentioned before, cords, changes in flooring, old carpets, like we see here in this picture. Um, all of these can be trip hazards and can lead to a fall. Um, <laughs> uh, so if she, while we're talking about falls um, and, and slippers, slippers, the type of footwear that you wear is very important too. You can slip in slippers because the bottom can get worn away and they be, can become very uh, slippery on the bottom. They have no tread and you can easily uh, uh, trip with them. So make sure you have the type of slippers or footwear at home that have rubber soles and a back to, to them. The type that you just slide your feet into, those are the worst. They don't offer any support for your foot and it's very easy for you to trip. So those are really the worst to wear around the house. Um, it's also important about that we where I, that I mentioned before that you have proper lighting on walkways and on stairs. Um, slips on stairs are very uh, common, and one of the re one of the frequent reasons is there's no lighting in the stair or the stairway, and the stairs can get so dark that you just can't see them. So having um, Treads on the stairs and especially light colored treads that make the stairs visible are very important. Having a handrail on both sides of the stairs is also important. And also freeing up your hands when you're going down the stairs. You should always have at least one hand holding the handrail. You should never go up and down stairs with a basket of laundry in both hands or both hands being tied up carrying things where you can't hold on to at least one handrail. It's better to make two or three trips than it is to walk down up and down the stairs without having any grip on the handrail because it's just so easy to fall. 
Um, so that's very important. Um, also, many falls can occur in the bathroom. So having grab bars is very important, um, especially in the shower where it's wet and can be slippery. Having um, the, uh, the um, bathtub redone so that it has grips on the bottom so that when you're showering, um, you have your feet have something to grip onto that the tub isn't just so smooth and shiny and easy to slip. You can get those decals at any hardware store and apply them when the tub is dry and then let them dry and they're very helpful and they provide a very good grip. Um, and then you want to have anti skid bath mats getting in and out of the getting in and out of the shower. Because when you step out of the shower, you want to make sure that on that tile floor the mat has a rubber backing and that it's very secure on the floor. Okay, so those, those are all very important things um, that you want to look for in your house. There is a home safety checklist that you can use to go through all the uh, um, rooms in your house, preferably with um, a friend, family member, or neighbor, and you can check off all the hazards and you can make corrections as you go and that will be provided in the chat box, that resource on where you can find it, okay? And lastly, you should always have, always have access to a phone in the instance that you do fall at home. If you can't carry your phone around, um, Alexa, Google, or an Apple Watch can be helpful to call out and uh, call for help, okay? Um, so that's very useful and that's very important as well. Some people do like to carry their cell phone around with them all the time and that provides a way that they can call um, in case of a fall, they can call in the case of an emergency. Um, other useful technology that's on the market now um, includes falls alert, emergency alert systems like pendants, necklaces, bracelets, or the smartwatch that I just mentioned, exercise apps, motion sensors, lights on the floor level to uh, light your way, and baby monitors and cameras. Okay, I think we're on to uh, the next slide. Yeah, so that is a lot of great information. Um, and as we've both mentioned, there is there are a lot of resources in the, um, let me show you one more time in the resource page, which I'm going to copy and paste into the link right now. I apologize, I didn't realize that my, um, all of the things that I've been putting into the chat box this whole time have only been going to the other panelists. So I apologize, I think we have them all cut and paste into there now. But this is the website that um, shows the Fall Prevention Awareness Week events and then also the resources and that home safety checklist that Julia mentioned, if you click on that right there, this is that checklist and it goes through each room of your home, asking you questions, giving you some great um, advice on what to do to kind of change that. Um, and then at the very end, there's a list of a bunch of um, home maintenance and repair programs that could help. Like if you need grab bars installed, these are some great um, options of uh, free or low cost home maintenance. So I think um, that at this point, we'll open it up to some questions and I will share our contact information with you. If you have any questions at all, um, please just feel free to reach out to us. If you need any of the links that we sent out, I know they all came quite late in this presentation as I, they, I didn't realize they weren't coming as we were going through, um, let us know. But this is uh, our contact information for both Julia and myself. And um, uh, let me open up the chat box and we're opening it up for questions and comments. And I just want to add that the home safety checklist and many of the other resources are available in Spanish as well. And a bunch of other languages too. And a bunch too. of other languages. Yeah. 
That was awesome, you guys. Thank you so much. Well done. I always love when it goes so successful and you guys look beautiful and everything is great. So yeah, so you turned it over to Q&A. Um, usually how we do it is like Julie will read the questions, but if you guys can see them, you can feel free to, you know, um, yeah, answer as you see them coming in. Um, even if you see anything in the chat that you want to address, go for it. Sure. There was one thing in the chat that came um, a little bit earlier that someone suggested um, taking a photo of all of your medications. That's a great idea. I, you know, I, having that photo and having the list is just, you know, the icing on the cake. It's like, in case you accidentally wrote it down incorrectly on your list, if you have a picture of it, then the doctors will definitely not have any questions. So that's a, that's a great suggestion. Thank you. So if, 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 if attendees don't have any questions, I guess we can just chit chat the, uh, the remaining um, three minutes. What do we have? Where are we at? Um, 3.56. Um, so is there anything else that you guys think that uh, attendees would benefit from knowing maybe about like what's going on at the hospitals, like any updates? Stuff like that. Sure. Yeah. Great question. So um, I know a lot of the hospitals throughout the city, um, and I know mine for sure, but I'm, I'm sure everybody has really done a great job cleaning, refreshing, putting a lot of policies and procedures in place to ensure that it is safe for you to come to the hospital. And that's not just coming to the emergency room, that's also coming to your doctor, your primary care physician, your cardiologist. We don't suggest, I know this is a little bit, if it's a hard time right now and people are trying to stay safe, but you need to have your annual checkups. You need to make sure that if you're feeling weird, if you're feeling different, if you're not sure if you know something's going on, don't delay going to the doctor. And we've seen some people who have even fallen at home and have been injured that have like been at home with these injuries and the injuries are potentially getting worse and then they're coming to the hospital when they kind of can't handle it anymore. So we always say, if you need to go to the doctor, if you need to go to the hospital, don't delay. They are doing so much to ensure that it is safe for you to come. Um, like when you come to the emergency room, we have it totally separated. So it's not like you're going to have a COVID patient right next to you. They're doing a lot and they've done a lot to make sure that it's safe for you and um, in the hospital and out of the hospital. So yes, please don't delay your care. Thank you. That was, that was a big concern. That is so important, what Gia said, you know, don't delay your care, especially if you have an acute injury or a fall. Um, you know, if it's an emergency, especially, please make sure that, you know, you get proper medical attention right away. And don't delay your screenings as well, you know. Um, you know, you need to have your annual eye exam and you need to have your hearing check. And don't delay because, um, you know, doctors and hospitals have done a really wonderful job making sure that, you know, it, it, it is safe. There's extra cleaning precautions and safe. There's social distancing. We're wearing masks. And one thing I want to add to is please get a flu shot. It's very yeah. important. Am I right, Tia? <laughs> yeah. The, so we just <laughs> actually, um, <laughs> yes, I'll get your flu shot this year, especially. Um, we just had a, like a town hall for employees yesterday. And although our hospital is prepared for a second wave, which all of them are, we've been through it once, we know what to do if there were a second wave of COVID. But if, you, if there is a spike in COVID and regular flu season, if we don't have enough space, then we don't have enough space. So it's very important that you get your flu shot and like, save the beds for people who really need them. Yeah. Um, also, if you get the flu and COVID at the same time, that's probably not gonna be as easy to get over if you only had like a mild case of one or the other on a normal year. So yeah, definitely get your flu shots. Thank yeah. you. So, yeah, Julia, I'm sorry, Julia. No, she is right. You know, you don't, don't let the flu bring you to the hospital. Yeah, so yeah. that actually, so we're at four o'clock now, but like we have some wiggle room. I just don't want to like impose on your guys' time, but I just, so I have just one quick question because when we have nor when we have hospital 
um, hospital staff, you know, it's exciting for us because you guys are like, you're the, you're on the inside, you know, you know what's going on. So we like to like pick your brain. So is it true? Um, do I understand correctly that Rumsey, um, I'm sorry, that Staten Island South is exclusively a COVID free hospital and then North is going to function as more where if people need to go on ventilators and like. That's what, correct. All right. So, yes, okay. That's, 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 that's correct. correct. That's a really cool thing. And then the other thing that's, you know, the word on the street, if you will, um, although I think I saw it in the advance, like very official, is that Rumsey, that brand new facility that they have on Bard and um, that they devoted that to like a, a strictly like um, COVID rehabilitation center, like with psych services and, and, you know, physical rehabilitation for people that were that survived and like need some rehab. Is that true? Well, I can't, you know, really speak for Rumsey because I, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm Staten Island University Alpha, but that is my understanding as well. Yeah. Okay, great. I just want to, yeah, because I saw it a while back. I didn't get to get into the article too much, but okay. Good yeah, to know. That is, that is my understanding. Yeah. Yes, you're correct. You guys, thank you so much. You guys, that was amazing. Um, so we're excited that um, this is recorded again so that you guys can go back and you can, you can um, review it as well. And if there's, if there's any closing remarks, now's your chance. If not, then we will conclude the webinar and thank you again so much for your time. And you're always welcome to come back when you have updates or new presentations, like whatever you think, you know, is worth sharing. You want to do some Tai Chi, Gia, you're welcome to do that. <laughs> and Julia, yes. oh, that's a much. That's a great, um, a great plug. So I am currently teaching virtual Tai Chi for arthritis and fall prevention classes. They are an evidence-based fall prevention program, one of the best things you can do to prevent falls. Um, unfortunately, at this time, my sessions that are, they're, they're, they've already started and they're closed for registration. But if you are interested in a, um, a future course, I'm not sure what the new year will bring. We'll see. Um, we usually don't do courses in you know the end of November into December because they are eight week sessions, twice a week for eight weeks. Um, so I wouldn't be starting until the new year. Uh, I don't know if I'll be still working from home or in the office. We'll see, but if you are interested, let me know and I can add you to a list that I've been keeping just in case if we do have them, at least I will have people who are interested, you know, ready to go. All right, that's awesome, Gia. So um, like I said, Julia, um, if you have any other closing remarks about, um, about Northwell, um, you are more than welcome to share. If not, we can say good afternoon and goodbye. I want to thank you for uh, the PSS for hosting us. Thank really you. appreciate that. And we were happy to present. And also to our attendees, thank you for attending today. And if you have any questions um, or concerns or anything you want, our contact information is up there. Our phone numbers are up there. Please give us a call. Um, any questions or issues that you have, we'll be glad to, 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 to answer them for you. Thank you, for, thank you for being so accessible to the community and especially in this time of heightened anxiety and fear. You guys are amazing. Um, okay, so um, Juliana, my Julie, did I nail it? Yeah, absolutely. Good? <laughs> so we just want to thank you so much for doing this. Okay, we just, um, we, if you want, we can just give through a quick um, like little um, announcement about what we have coming up. So you want to you want to talk about Greg tomorrow, Jules? Yes, okay. Um, yeah, so for anyone who is still here with us, um, we so tomorrow morning at 11 a.m., uh, we are having another presentation with uh, Gregory Drapkin from the Alzheimer's Association, uh, where he will be speaking with us on, um, he will be enlightening us on how to strengthen our caregiver toolkits. So that is again tomorrow at 11 a.m. Um, if you are not already registered, you can go onto our website, onto our events page, and register there. Awesome. Uh, so that's great. That's, uh, that's pretty much that. No, I wish that we had our, our contact info, but we, we, can't, we didn't do that. But we, you guys have our emails from when you registered. So if there's any follow-up questions for PSS Circle of Care, feel free to email me directly or um, it's in the beginning of this. If you watch the recording, you can get our info. Um, and I think we're good, ladies. We did it. Yep. All right, awesome. It was nice to e meet you, ladies. And again, thank you so much for your time and your amazing knowledge. And uh, we look forward to doing it again. Have a great day. Thank you, thank too. Bye-bye. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye. Bye.